to the session on planetary science. Um, my name is Wendell Mendel. I'm a planetary scientist at the NASA Johnson Space Center. And um, I was invited to come and give a kind of a lead off keynote uh, speech in this uh, session called Planetary Science and Concepts. And I agreed to do that on the theory that somebody else in my organization would actually come and give a talk. <laughs> that, that, turned, that turned out to be a no-op. And uh, so as a result, I ended up giving the talk. Normally, I really love to do these things. I've done it for about 15 years or so. But at the beginning of the year, um, due to some changes in our management, I was given three administrative jobs to do. And that turns out to be a series of emergencies piled on top of one another, and as a result, I found myself with really no time to focus or think very much about uh, this particular talk. So I uh, will apologize in advance for that, but what I want to do this morning is, in theory, share with you some thoughts about planetary science and particularly the processes and institutions carry it out. Normally in the AIAA technical mini symposium where we are today, there is uh, there are speakers who are really interested in the technical aspects of various kinds of space missions, space endeavors. And, and since this is a, a symposium sponsored by the JSC AIAA section, uh, the talks tend to be heavy in uh, operations, flight operations, and in engineering. Um, that's fine. What is lacking quite often in some of these uh, sessions is a sense of the science, the science being in, in many ways the customer of the activities that uh, NASA engages in. And I'm one of the people who represents the science community. So I feel it's always useful to have an opportunity to come to you and talk a little bit about that side of the equation. Um, the, Planetary science has changed a lot in the 40 years of the history of NASA, and particularly changed a lot as it has had everything else under the regime of Dan Golden since 1992. And there are new ways currently of looking and thinking about planetary science, and there are also some, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about those and some of the, the important aspects of that. And then I also want to, at the end of my talk, tell you a little bit about a really exciting activity which ties into the planetary science that's now taking place at uh, Johnson Space Center. These are the planning stages in the planetary science group. So um, I have a talk here that I gave five years ago in Barcelona, and I pulled it out, and it's not exactly the one I wanted to give today, but it has a lot of elements in it of, of what I uh, wanted to talk about. The, In, in the early part of this century, if you talked about adventure and exploration, you would have been talking about polar expeditions. The names of people like uh, Amundsen, Scott, Perry, and Shackleton, and so on, were on the lips of people who were thinking about where the frontier was, where hardship took place, uh, exploring new regimes, and so on. Later in the century, the scientific community was really interested in polar regions and wanted to somehow coordinate a study of what went on in the polar regions. And in the 30s, a group of scientists got together and convinced their governments to sort of sponsor something called the International Polar Year, where various uh, scientific expeditions were sponsored to go to the poles and, and study the Arctic and the Antarctic regions. It was really quite successful. It was an international effort, and we learned a lot about those remote regions of the Earth through it. Remember that before World War II, science in general was not funded by governments. It intended to be funded by uh, universities or patrons or even sometimes individuals who had been hired as teachers and paid for their science out of their own pockets. Uh, in World War II, there was a sea change in how we saw science and technology, and it was realized that basic science and the discovery
discoveries therein could be could be utilized and uh, capitalized on in order to create exciting new technologies which were applied by the military in World War II. And after World War II, uh, Vannevar Bush was very instrumental in writing a paper which talked about how science ought to be managed and structured in the post-war era. And so we saw for the first time the federal government as a major sponsor of science in, in, the, in the idea that basic research, uh, technology development, were all things which were useful to the country, both in the military sense, but also in an economic sense. And so, uh, in the 50s, a group of scientists who were really interested in the Earth as a whole planet decided to get together and try to recreate the event, which was the International Polar Year some years before, and call it the International Geophysical Year create uh, an international group of scientists who would study the Earth and collect data in sort of a 18-month focused uh, collaboration, uh, and they hope to bring in governments and so on to, to work on that. Uh, when, when this idea was presented to the U.S. State Department and, and the Eisenhower administration as to whether the United States wanted to participate in this International Geophysical Year, they were very interested and excited to learn that one of the activities planned for that Jupiter year was to launch something called a satellite on top of something called a rocket in order to explore the properties of space around the Earth. And in the plan for the International Geophysical Year, both the United States and the Soviet Union uh, had plans to put satellites on the rockets. The uh, State Department urged the Eisenhower administration to support the International Geophysical Year because it solved a uh, foreign policy problem. And that was that as uh, the military in, in classified discussions was trying to figure out how to deal with the Soviet Union since it was a closed society, there was no way to find out what was going on in it except through some kind of uh, reconnaissance, either spies or, or some sort of surveillance. Uh, and in the early 50s, the U-2 plane with Gary Francis Powers were shot down by the Soviets, and Nikita Khrushchev made a tremendous political um, plum out of that event at the United Nations, and basically humiliated the Eisenhower administration, accused them of spying, and so on. Uh, the military had decided that the next way to really look at the Soviet Union was through something called reconnaissance satellites, cameras in space. And, but there was a real problem, and that was that the reason the U-2 incident was so uh, dramatic was that the U.S. was accused of violating Soviet airspace. And there was international law that the space above your country belonged to you, and if other people went into it for any reason, then that was an act of war or, or uh, breaking international law. And the problem was that if a satellite passed over a particular country, would it be violating international law? Within the International Geophysical Year, the fact that there were satellites being launched for noble, pure scientific purposes, and that these satellites would pass all over the Earth, uh, it was seen as a natural solution to this problem of whether or not airspace extended to infinity above a particular country. because. Um, since the Soviets and the U.S. were both participating in this, it seemed to set a precedent that it was really okay to put these satellites in orbits around the Earth that would pass over different countries, and it really didn't violate any kind of international law. And in fact, the State Department would be perfectly happy if the Soviets launched theirs first in order to set the precedent. Well, as we all know, the Soviets did launch theirs first, and it was a satellite called Sputnik. And even though it was generally known that it was going to happen, it came as a total surprise to the rest of the world at a time when there was tremendous tensions over the Cold War and concern about uh, the, the Soviet threat of missiles and, and delivery of nuclear weapons. And at the time, there was a, uh, a widespread belief in the United States that everything the Soviets got had been stolen by communist sympathizers hiding within the U.S.
U.S. society. And when they did something that we had never done before, that really put a hole in that myth that they were totally incapable of any activity except what they could steal. So uh, that began really the space race where there was a tremendous tension uh, over whether or not the Soviets had technical leads on us, whether or not the, the communist way of life was the appropriate way to deal with the future world in which technology was dominant, as opposed to the capitalistic free market enterprise system. And so there was this tremendous tension between the US and the Soviet Union in the Cold War that resulted in Kennedy's announcement that we should go to the moon uh, and land a man there and bring him back before the end of the decade, which was intended as a demonstration that the US was not technologically lagging and that, that we could focus and, and do wonderful things as a country and we're better than those dirty commies. So you all know that story. And, and you know about Apollo. The, the, the interesting thing was that Apollo that were really unintended by the politicians who created the event as a solution to a political problem. Apollo turned out to be a cultural event, uh, turned out to be a scientific event, it turned out to be a management event, it turned out to be an engineering event, and you can find Apollo written about in the literature of a number of different disciplines as being a, a milestone in certain aspects, for example, the management of large complex projects. Apollo demonstrated what was supposedly a, a, an unusual and unique US capacity to manage large complex projects. You can find these aspects of that Apollo program discussed in different parameter spaces without really any reference to other parameter spaces. In my particular field, planetary science, Apollo was a, was a fantastic scientific breakthrough. NASA, when, when it planned Apollo, had no sense that there would be science associated with it. The idea was the astronaut would step out, plant the flag, salute it, drop the plaque, and come back. And there were people in NASA who, after that happened with Neil Armstrong, was all were ready to quit because it was just so scary to send those guys out there and risk death. And they thought we really ought to stop. The scientists, however, once they believed that it actually was going to happen, began to argue, well, wait a minute, you're going to be there. You ought to pick up something and bring it back. And that really confused the NASA system because it, wasn't really in, in, the, in the scheme of things. But there were some very powerful people uh, in the political establishment who established that really some Apollo ought to have some scientific elements to it. And, and in the end, it did. And in the end, it accomplished quite a bit. And in the end, it brought back the first real samples from another planet. And those, the analysis of those samples and the understanding of the existence of that planet did several things. First of all, created a brand new field called planetary science. In, in the very first meetings of what was called the Lunar Science Conference, uh, there were two types of disciplines. There were astronomers who were used to looking at the moon through telescopes and who had their own ideas about what things were on the moon. And then there were geologists who were not used to looking at the moon at all, but were used to looking at rocks. And they could take these rocks and come up with their conclusions of what this place was like of what the rocks were like. And these two communities had a lot of trouble even talking to one another because their language was totally different. And so the first few years of uh, the Lunar Science Conference had a lot of contentiousness, in a lot of ways, but contentiousness based on these two cultures sort of clashing and trying to mesh. And what came out of it was a, a hybrid culture called planetary science where we're quite comfortable people who have geological and earth science backgrounds talking about what goes on in planets, working with people who fly physics instruments and telescopes and so on, and spacecraft and, and do analysis from ground-based telescopes. We all go to the same conference and we all collaborate on the same proposals. But before Apollo, planetary science as a field didn't really exist. The second thing that happened was that because was, was this astounding fact that the rocks from the moon were so old, no 
Pilates, with one exception, dreamed that the, the moon, the surface of the moon, was as old as it was. And in fact, in general, the surface of the moon is much older than almost any surface of the Earth you can find, because the Earth changes and so recycles itself through planetary tectonics and volcanism and weathering and erosion and various kinds of processes. So it's very difficult to find ancient rocks that date back to the beginning of the Earth. The moon has looked everywhere. So suddenly we, we got sort of in points and began to get some feel about how planets work because of what we can see in the early stages of the moon and what we know about the history of the Earth. And then the next big discovery was the fact that all these holes in the moon were actually from impacts. There was a debate as to whether they were volcanoes or craters from impacting objects. And it was discovered for sure that there were craters from impacting objects. All of them were craters from impacting objects, at least 99.99%. And that, uh, what that meant was, that, and the dating of these became very important because you needed the rocks to actually date them from radioactive isotopes. Radioactive isotopes. And it, the, the thing was that these things were very old, and that meant that very early in the solar system, the history of the solar system, about 500 million years after the beginning of the solar system, moon underwent a cataclysmic bombardment, and since it must have been in the vicinity of the Earth, the Earth must have undergone that cataclysmic bombardment. And in fact, when we look on other planets like Mars, for example, we see terrains that are heavily cratered, and the presumption is that Mars underwent that cataclysmic bombardment, and we see craters on Mercury, the presumption is that Mercury went through the cataclysmic bombardment. And so suddenly, the moon becomes kind of a Rosetta Stone to processes happening very early in the solar system. And a lot of the very profound pronouncements that you hear from scientists after planetary missions of interpreting what that photograph means is really based on things that happened, that people learned about on the moon, and is a, an extrapolation to the fact, well, it must have happened there. Although, quite frankly, we really don't know until we go there and pick up rocks from those places. And that's leads into another story. Another profound fact was the fact that the craters, since they must be on the Earth, and then things were found on the Earth that were craters that had been once proposed to be some volcanic and so on. Everything circular was volcanic on the Earth. So we began to learn that these impacts really hit the planet. And then we came to this whole uh, new idea about the dinosaurs being eliminated by an asteroid hitting, and now we've got worried about asteroids eliminating us. And, and none of those ideas would have ever even been thought of or realized before Apollo. So in some sense, Apollo has changed the whole way we view our planet. We understand that we live in a neighborhood, and we have sort of weather and things that happen in this neighborhood. We're just not an isolated, happy place that you know, go over the hill and discover maybe a different climate, but we don't have to really worry about the sky. Well, the sky is part of us, and nowadays, as you know, there's something called the Sun-Earth connection, where since we all depend on satellites and we have solar storms, they knock out the satellites and suddenly the credit cards won't work at the gas pump anymore because the satellite got knocked out. And our society is becoming now more dependent on this, this whole network. Well, in, after Apollo, uh, there was a resentment in the planetary science community because the Earth and the Moon are really only two places in the solar system. And there were scientists who argued that we really ought to look at other places in the solar system. And there was a whole institution called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which makes it, it's, its living by putting things on rockets and sending them places. And so the planetary science community, and with the, uh, in collaboration with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, had a profound influence on the whole structure of planetary science in the post-Apollo era. In fact, there was almost, there's been nothing done on the moon up until the recent lunar prospector. And that was actually an accident, an administrative accident that didn't happen. So, but the moon has been shut out because there was this feeling, well, you spent $25 billion in that, those dollars, $100 billion in our dollars on the moon. So why do we need to do that again? got all these other planets. And, and the philosophy was that uh, it was neat to build bigger and bigger spacecraft and go to the planets. 
Viking landed on Mars, it was actually a, a Langley Research Center spacecraft, it caused a tremendous uh, impression on the public. Even the President of the United States called up as an NASA administrator when Viking 1 landed. Gosh, that's fantastic. What are you going to do next? And it turned out the NASA administrator didn't know. No. And when the Viking 2 landed, the President of the United States called the NASA administrator again, and the NASA administrator was out of town. <laughs> and the planetary community in those days were just outraged that the NASA administrator wasn't there to tell the planet the president, well, you know, I'm glad you called because we have a brand new mission that we can tell you about if you'd like us to come over and, and that, you know, so out to lunch. So, so JPL jumped into the fray and decided that the answer to the next mission was to put Viking on wheels on Mars because Carl Sagan had said, you know, we didn't find life here, but I bet you it just go over that bridge. Over there. So they were going to put Viking on reels for $2 billion in 1976 money. And our group in planetary science got into a huge fight because for $2 billion we thought we could bring back a piece of Mars. And but Bruce Murray's famous quote at that time, who was director of the JPL, was that in order to sell missions to Congress, you can't have gray mice, you've got to have purple pigeons. And lunar missions were considered to be gray mice, very kind of colorless pigeons, but purple pigeons were very glamorous, and so things that you could hang a lot of bells and whistles on, have cameras on, would sell to Congress. And in the 70s and 80s, there was this big idea that they needed to sell big missions to Congress. And so we, we went through the, the Voyagers and the, and the Mariners and the various planets, and there was a matrix of exploring the planets. You start out with a flyby, you go into orbit, you then uh, try to land a robot, and then eventually a human being goes, and, and we list the planets, we list the stages we're in, and you you know try to do the, the flybys all the way out to Pluto, and humans to the moon and Mars, and you kind of move down this matrix like this, and that was the way planetary science was organized. So organized by object, kind of moving out to the solar system. Um, a funny thing happened about 1980, and that was planetary science almost died. Uh, there was a budget crisis, uh, the debt was increasing, uh, we were not doing very, NASA's budget was falling, the shuttle was overrunning its budget, and in the Reagan administration, President Reagan came in with the paradigm that we were going to cut everything, and there was fear struck by the hearts of us civil servants who thought that we were on, on, the, on the block. Uh, and in fact, the new deputy administrator, Hans Marr, he was appointed in 19 one, wrote a memo which was supposed to be secret but got leaked to everybody. And it basically said maybe we ought to take planetary science and just stop for 10 years and not do anything until we get this shuttle straightened out. And uh, that created a great flurry of activity. <coughs> planetary scientists formed political action committees and it was all kind of, for the first time, became politically active and so on. But the 80s were really a dead time for planetary science. But, but the the game, in some sense, had shifted to astrophysics, where the great observatories were planned, the Hubble Space Telescope, what was known as the Advanced X-ray Facility, now called Chandra, which is just now about to be launched, the Gamma Ray Observatory, now called Compton, and then something called the uh, uh, sort of the uh, Shuttle Infrared, I forget, Space Infrared Laboratory, but all these were, to, in theory, to be huge complexes in lower orbit to be serviced and maintained by the shuttle. The Hubble was the first of those, and they decided it was really a bad idea to do that. And the rest of them now have different forms, and sort of being places fairly small, quite capable facility out beyond the moon, but it flies. Um, so planetary science not only lost out uh, because of budget problems, but it lost out because of an emphasis in science in NASA on astrophysics. And that was where um, we came in in about 89. Now, or in, came in in the 80s. Now, what happened in the 80s was that uh, because these huge missions were causing more and more, the Purple Pigeon idea had not really panned out very well because the cost of the Purple Pigeons was just so high. These are. Mariner missions, Galileo, uh, 
Magellan, and so on. Uh, I think those are the Viking landers up there, and you can see that there was a general trend in, in development cost upward like this, and that just couldn't go on forever. And so the planetary people in NASA decided that what they would try to do would be to create a different kind of mission class, which they call the planetary observer, and be modeled after the very successful explorer class in physics, which are very small impact missions. And so they set out to create the observers, and, and Magellan was really the first, it was declared retroactively to be the first observer. But then they created Mars Observer. Part of the philosophy of the observer class of missions was that you would use kind of buses that you use for orbiting satellites, cheaper, you kind of use the things you used for the orbit because there were four of them and people built them and you had to do it. And you would use all this sort of off-the-shelf stuff and then send it out to the planets. Unfortunately, Mars Observer, because of various administrative reasons, um, was not an inexpensive mission. It was not the $100 or $200 mission. It was thought to be, it ended up to be a $1 billion mission. And when it got to Mars, it disappeared. And the board that analyzed the disappearance of Mars Observer said that the problem probably was that some of this Earth orbit technology was used inappropriately in a long distance planetary mission because of people doing it truly had, had experience and they could throw it. So the whole concept of this inexpensive observer sort of fell through the floor. And planetary science was really not doing very well when Dan Golden arrived on the scene. Dan Golden has introduced um, a number of different ideas in NASA. But in the planetary science, one of the ideas that he's introduced is something called the Discovery Program. And the lecture that I prepared five years ago was prepared just when the Discovery Program was announced. And it was intended to be a rather cynical look at the comparison between Discovery and Observer. Discovery had, if you read the buzzwords on the charts in the NASA, uh, documents, you would find that the exact same words were being used that had been used in years before for Observer. And so my question was, if it didn't work then, why do you think it's going to work now to keep costs low? But there were a couple of really major changes that went on with the discovery. The first is that Dan Golden put an honest cost cap on the missions. He basically told people, that if you don't stay within budget, you're canceled. And of course, nobody believed it at first until people got canceled. And then they began to really understand that it was real, to really had to keep the cost of capital. The second thing that happened was that for the first time, the principal investigator, the scientist, was placed in charge of the mission, i.e., the money was given to the customer to buy the mission. The normal way that NASA conducted missions in the past was that a mission would be approved by some sort of advisory review process. A NASA institution would be in charge of that mission. It would give out monies to scientists. It would give out monies to contractors. It would give out monies to operations. And the oversight within the NASA system was so inefficient and burdensome that the cost would constantly rise because there would be people lobbying this change or that change, and it would be much better if this detector was on and so on. The new system was that the scientist, who is the customer, who really wants the data, I mean, it's, this, is not, this is not an impersonal thing, they really want the data. The scientist is given the check and, and told, buy your mission, and he works with an industrial partner, and that industrial partner has to worry about the science, and NASA's taken out of the loop, and it turns out that People thought that that was interesting, but the problem was that with the small, with the low cost cap on these missions, you couldn't do things to the outer solar system because it just required more money, more robust spacecraft to work out those planets, and that's turned out to be true. But nevertheless, in the first discovery proposal session, there were about 12 missions proposed, really outstanding missions with good, high quality scientists, with good, high quality industrial partners associated with those scientists, but there was so little money that only about one or two missions were funded. And 
And so suddenly everybody who had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to write a proposal in the industrial sector said, this doesn't really look very interesting to me anymore. And as a result, in the past years, even though Discovery has been a really quite successful program, uh, we find that there's kind of a scarcity of new proposals and missions because of the sense in industry that they really don't want to invest in, invest in something where, the, where there's more losers than winners. And so one of the ideas that I've been floating recently is that as we look at ways to uh, change the way NASA operates and to figure out where new emphases ought to be put, that within the scientific arena, we really ought to expand the budget on the discovery program for a couple of reasons. Uh, First of all, it would give more chances to do good science. Second of all, it would keep a steady rate of industrial partners involved in the game. And that turns out to be important because recently, as you know, we had six launch failures in a row. And when we do the analysis of the launch failures, they all seem to be unrelated. Um, I heard Pete Aldridge talk in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and he believes that part of the problem is has to do with workmanship even though you can't point to anything specific. In reality, I think it has to do with the fact that we just don't launch enough in the sense that we don't have a group of ex experts who flow through the program over the generations and train new people to come in behind them. We have gaps of a bunch of people who did things once, and then young people who are really out of communication with the older, more experienced people. And so there's a density problem, density of activity. I think that everything we can do in space to increase the density of activity is really important, and increasing the discovery budget would be one way to do that. Another thing in my last few minutes that I want to talk about is another aspect of Dan Golden's uh, imprint, imprint on, this, on these, what is now called the Space Science Enterprise. Rather than looking at objects and missions as sort of uh, molecules from which you build the program, Dan Golden has talked about themes. And in the science portal, there are four themes. There is solar system exploration. There is uh, exploring the universe. There is origins, which means origin of life, origin of the universe, origin of the solar system, origins of us, and then the Sun-Earth connection. And it turns out that Golden's political sense has paid off tremendously well because these themes, which are abstract and sort of philosophical, resonate well with both the public and with Congress. It makes the matching up of the NASA institutions who fly missions a little difficult because you've got to figure out what theme you fall into and, and how the money flows through the themes and, and that sort of thing. But in the theme of origins and the search for life, Golden decreed that the Mars Surveyor Program, which is an ongoing program, managed to get two launches to Mars in a year for about 10 years, must return a sample from the planet Mars uh, from the 2005 launch. And initially, JPL resisted that tremendously because JPL is really not interested in pieces of the planet. It's interested in remote sensing and particularly the rovers, anything that has a rover, which is particularly good. And so, but Golden held his ground, and now there is, there are plans in the work for the return of a sample in, uh, from the 2005 mission, which would arrive on the Earth in about 2008. Um, that's a story in itself. I don't have time to get into it. What I want to talk about is the sample itself. Uh, for the first time in about 30 years, samples from outside the Earth are, are starting to arrive. We will have at the, right now at the Johnson Space Center, we have the lunar rocks which are still cared for there, and it's a very complex, the caring for the rocks is a very complex, technically and administratively difficult process. That's also another story. We also take care at the Johnson Space Center of the Antarctic meteorites. Every season, the National Science Foundation funds an expedition to Antarctica to pick up meteorites off the ice. Why they're in the ice, I don't have time to tell you right now. They're, they're the property of the Smithsonian. But there's a contract with the Smithsonian to house them at the Johnson Space Center because of our expertise in the lunar samples. In addition to those two, there is a, a 
collection of cosmic dust, micron-sized particles that have been collected in the upper atmosphere and on high-flying aircraft and represent samples of meteorites or, or comets that have fallen into the atmosphere. There will soon arrive, in the next few years, a sample of the solar wind on a discovery mission called Genesis. Shortly thereafter, there will arrive a sample of a comet on a discovery mission called Stardust. And then, and there might become a, a, another sample of a Japanese mission that uses C from an asteroid. Uh, then comes the biggie, the Mars sample. And the, of course, the advertised aspect of the Mars sample is that it might contain life. We're searching for life on Mars. And since the announcement of findings the Antarctic meteorite were made by my colleagues in uh, 1996, there has been, of course, a tremendous um, intense research effort and a lot of uh, uh, insults and other things passed around on, on this particular topic. But nevertheless, there is thought to be some reasonable chance that we will find fossils and possibly even living organisms. And that puts the sample from Mars in a totally different category from any of these other samples. That is, there is this issue of the Andromeda strain. Uh, if the thing comes back from Mars, will it destroy all of us and our civilization? Now remember, this is going to be something that's about this big, but you never know. And so as a result, there is a strategy being developed, actually only being waved at right now, uh, about what to do when this thing comes back. Uh, the JPL mission right now, in order to save mass, has no parachute or capsule that comes back from the Earth. So it will bury it bury itself in the state of Utah. Uh, we haven't gotten Utah's permission to do that yet. But <laughs> that's just, that's it, that's it work. It will bury itself in Utah and then somehow be taken from that capsule, from that place, and the Earth will be safeguarded. And then after the Earth is safeguarded and we are sure there's no danger, then the sample will be scientifically studied. That's about the level of detail. What we've been doing at the Johnson Space Center is trying to fill in all of those gaps in a lot higher level of detail. And one of the things we've discovered is, is that the normal scenario is, well, you put this sample behind a biosafety level 4 facility, which they have in the Center for Disease Control for Dietrich. They'll build one in Galveston, state of the art one in Galveston uh, in the next year or two. This is where you treat the Ebola virus and all the other really bad things and keep it safe. And it has levels security and guardianship. And the whole point of biosafety level 4 facility is to keep it from getting to us. There is another problem with the Mars sample. We need to keep us from getting to it. So there has to be some kind of inner sanctum that protects the Mars sample from everything else. And biosafety level 4 facilities are, among other things, incredibly dirty in terms of organic materials. It would be a no-no near the Mars sample. So we've now come up with a set of concepts which have to do, actually, with goes into what I call safety level five, where the air pressures change, the cleanliness changes, the whole protocol changes, and it really introduces a new level of, of technology and sample handling and protocols that have never really been thought through before, either by the bio, uh, biology community or by the sample handling very exciting time beginning to work on these technologies and we're beginning to fight the battles about whether we will actually be able to handle it. Um, well, I have exhausted my time. So, uh, if you have a question or two, I'll be glad to try to answer it and then we have to move on to the program. Um, when you're trying to protect something from the outside world, put it in a high pressure Right. The outside world or something, you put it in the lower pressure chain. You, you, what are they going to do alternately? You, you, you hit on exactly one of the conundrums. <laughs> because in the biosafety level four, the pressure is lower, successfully so lower inside, so the leakage will go in. But this inner sanctum has to have pressure the other way, so the leakage will go out. And that's one of the way, one of the things. We could alter it? Well, no, no. I have some actually diagrams here that talk about that. But there, there are ways to manage that which you need to think about. It's not just obvious uh, of how you deal with that. But that's only one of the issues. Yes. 
something I have always wondered about when we talk about viruses and diseases from outer space coming to Earth, we're assuming that they will be brought back in samples that humans or robots from Earth will bring back. But of course, with our natural meteor falls, I'm wondering if some of these outbreaks of disease we have had in the past might, might have been diseases from outer space that came in naturally on meteorites. And in other words, we could have an Andromeda strain even if we never brought samples back from the moon. Or we might be the Andromeda strain. Uh, <laughs> so he would be the Andromeda? Yeah, I mean, maybe we, maybe we are from outer space in our original form of uh, primitive life. Fred Boyle has talked about that, about viruses coming in comments and so on. He correlates uh, epidemics with meteor uh, storms. And there's not a lot of uh, weight put on those arguments, but it's not new. Uh, and, and of course, one of the arguments of the sample community is, yeah, we have all these Mars meteorites now why haven't we been infected already? You're going to hear a lot more about this. There's already committees being formed to prevent the sample from ever coming back from the Earth. And the United Nations is going to get involved, and there's going to be a lot of, of advisory boards formed and so on, and it's going to be a real circus. I mean, it's not, it's, the technical side of it is going to be the more straightforward side. It's going to be a very interesting uh, sociological look. Um, I want to ask your personal opinion about uh, since, uh, since uh, the tree huggers were unable to stop the launch of Cassini with 70 pounds of plutonium on board, and since we can probably not do it in the mission to Mars without boost, do you think that issue is settled now? Nuclear? Sorry. No, it's not settled at all. And in fact, I, I have commissioned myself to try to set up an international working group at the International Academy of Astronautics to look at the nuclear issue and try to separate fact from fiction try to understand what the policies are and to try to make a recommendation by an international body on uh, how to deal with nuclear sources for the exploration of space. For the exploration of space. And whether or not, first of all, they're needed or there are people who claim that the engineers are too lazy to think of other solutions. And, and, that, and so I want to find those people and have them tell me what the real solutions are. So, so there, there's a process that I'm, I'm going to be trying to set up in the near future to get people from across the world to sit down in a, in a working group and ferret out the activities because policymakers need to have the facts and they don't always trust things they get from various groups. So your group has to have a good category, make sure that everybody's represented, the, the anti nuclear as well as the pro nuclear, make sure that the events are on the right. I, I need to move on. And the next uh, talk is uh, Michael Halverson, who is uh, going to talk about manned interstellar missions, problem definition. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Halverson. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to talk about manned interstellar missions. Kind of, you'll indulge me for a moment to join me a little further in the future after we have gone through the solar system and are actually going outside the solar system to another planet or system. I wish I had hardware to show you, I wish I had something to bring to you, but what I'm going to do is talk about some of the questions that we're going to have to answer. As a good designer, I'm reluctant to say this, kind of present the box that fits in. Uh, hopefully this will prompt something to think out of the box. But specifically, we're talking about a manned mission outside our own solar system. I don't know where that is. There's hopefully some good candidates somewhere. It's a very formidable undertaking. Probably talking about something on the order of an entire civilization mounting the effort to do so. You're talking about solar resources, lunar minerals, asteroid minerals, Jovian gases, cometary ices, all of these things to hopefully get the thing done. Of all the questions, all the technical challenges, all the problems, you can sort of distill them down into three big questions. How do we get there? Where are we going? Why are we going there? I've chosen that order in a particular reason. The first one is theoretically the easiest to answer. Don't get confused. That doesn't mean it's easy. It's easier compared to the other one. This could represent a generation or more just to solve that question. So 
launch it into the how do we get there? Simple put. Sorry. We will construct an artificial environment, a bubble that will contain the crew, to which you will attach your control systems, your support systems, supplies, everything that you would need, and a propulsion system. Of these systems, I, I kind of picked three to really look at. They're kind of three crucial ones. The first being life support. We're sending people. We want to keep them healthy. It's going to have to be absolutely self-contained. Once you left the solar system, there's no way to get anything back. We're in lower orbit. but we're fortunate. If the problem with the home, if we're stuck, we send something up. Once you get out about Pluto, forget there's no chance of getting anything back. As such, it's going to have to have long-term reliability. I don't know what kind of mission we're going to feel. It could be a single generation within the lifetime of a person. You're talking about a system that's going to have to operate for a decade or two. You could be talking about a generational or if you're talking a century or uh, Leading into that next one, uh, mechanical systems in general, you're going to have to have long-term reliability. You're going to have, some, have something that is either multiply redundant, much as we use in the shuttle today, we have this idea of fail safe, fail operational. If we need one thing to survive, to be fail, remember, if we fail safe, we have to have a second one, so if one breaks, we're still okay. We go to fail operational, which says if one breaks, we want to keep going, gives us another one to break. A good example is why this is important. Imagine your car. Your car has brakes, windshield, tires. Imagine if every one of those systems had 100% working, or you'd lose yourself or your vehicle. Uh, how many people have a cracked windshield? How many people have more brakes? It becomes a very critical thing to look at. We want to make sure that if we have something there, it's either very reliable, easily fixed, it can operate in a reduced mode. Your car is a good example of a reduced mode. Your brakes will wear, but you'll still be able to stop. The system that's probably the most crucial is probably going to determine what sort of mission you have in your propulsion. It's sort of the key idea behind the mission. It's going to determine if you're, depending on what kind of system you have, it's going to either be a lifetime quick sprint kind of sports car spaceship or slower generation going to help you determine where you're going to go. If you can only go very slowly and you don't have the ability to do generation on ships, you're not going to go anywhere. Well, the repulsion systems, I kind of like to describe them as Newtonian and non-Newtonian. By Newtonian, I basically mean we take some mass, we throw it away. In throwing that mass away, we impose the momentum, we get a momentum transfer, that's how it goes. In case you're wondering, rockets don't push against the Earth. They work by momentum transfer. All Newtonian rockets work that way. You have chemical rockets. Well, I should step back home. We, we, have, we have to have an energy source of some kind to accelerate. Chemical rockets are nice that way. We have chemical energy. We mix the chemicals together, some energy is released. That heats up the propellants. We throw them out of nozzle, and that's what gets it going. There's some other systems I'll, I'll talk about them in just a moment. Hold on just a second. Uh, two big factors in America that we like to talk about propulsion systems are the specific impulse, and I like to add the thrust. The specific impulse, if you want to think about it, is the fuel mileage. In each system, specific impulse is measured in seconds, and it's best described as the amount of time a pound of fuel can produce a pound of thrust very much like, like gas mileage. If you want to do the, the metric conversions, you can, you can do that. There's a little bit of a danger here, at least I think of one, if you solely speak of specific impulse. Ion engines, I think of as, a, as an example of this. An ion engine has specific impulses of 1,000 seconds, 10,000 seconds. Phenomenal. They produce maybe 10 pounds of thrust. 
while you have this great fuel efficiency, if you're talking about a manned mission, you're talking about something that will take you 10 years to get up to Earth escape velocity, depending on how big your spacecraft is. You could be talking centuries just to get up the solar system. So we, we can't speak solely of a specific impulse. It's very important. Your, your fuel mileage is useful. But you also have to talk about the thrust as well. That would be your deciding factor of how fast you accelerate, how fast you accelerate, how fast you can go. And that will help you in determining where you can go, how far you can go. There's a book out, the Starflight Handbook by Malo and Matlock. And they went through and they took a, a sample of some of the main types of propulsion systems. And they looked at a ratio of the propulsive energy versus the rest mass energy. Rest mass energy is that, that e equals mc squared energy. It's the amount of energy that's contained in the matter there. This ratio says how much of that we can use for propulsion. I did a little bit of an algebraic manipulation and I thought maybe this would give us an idea of a maximum specific impulse, ISP. For chemical, they look at hydrogen and oxygen. It's about 530 seconds. To give you an idea of a comparison, the space shuttle main engine systems are a hydrogen oxygen system. They get about 450 seconds. The difference between the two, you can, I don't say easily, but you can explain as mechanical losses, inefficiencies, just the fact that you're not going to be able to use all that energy. One of the others they looked at was complete fission. Um, personally, I'm not real happy with the number they present. The fission engines, as we think of them today, are basically a core of radioactive material that you're going to use to generate heat. We're going to pump some sort of fuel, probably hydrogen, through it. It's going to be what we call a heat expansion engine. The fuel goes through, this heat is going to flash fry it, expand it. We'll shoot it out a nozzle, much like a rocket. The nervous system is an example of this. It was looked at in the 60s. The environmental concerns sort of prompted a lot of the, the reduction of the research. They had hoped to get up around 800 seconds. There are some theoretical systems. Uh, Nerva was what was called a solid core. The, the material remained as a solid core. In terms of fission, we can go another step further. We could go to a liquid core. This gives you a higher temperature difference. Temperature difference is actually what's going to give you your greater repulsive force, your higher ISP. The, the far out one, and I have not had a chance to really research much, is the gas core, where somehow you have gaseous uranium or something that you pump everything through. These, I, I've seen numbers, I don't know how, how accurate, how truthful they are, of upwards of 10,000 seconds. Bear in mind that propulsion is going to be radioactive coming out the back end, and you're obviously not going to. That's one of the benefits of chemical. Chemical may not have a high specific impulse, but it gives us a very high thrust, which we sort of need to get out of gravity. In terms of the next level of energetic, energetic propulsion is fusion. Uh, most likely what we'll do is we'll take a fusion reaction. We'll take some of that plasma, which is already very hot, and we'll use that to exhaust. I not see anybody do too much. I don't know that I hold a whole lot of, of, of faith in, in those numbers. The ones I always actually like are matter and antimatter. In this case, you would take a chunk of matter, a chunk of antimatter, bring them together, and one of the interesting qualities of this, when they come together, they're going to, as we think, annihilate each other. And in that annihilation, all that matter is converted to energy, E equals MC squared. For instance, if you ever get bored and really want to do some calculation, think of what one pound of matter has locked up as, as energy. Mallow and Matlow presented one level. Their efficiency, propulsive energy to rest mass energy was one. That's probably not very accurate. Um, a book out, the second book, actually very good, Prospects for Interstellar Travel by John Alden. He had a little bit of a discussion of saying, of that energy, of that, that annihilation energy, about a third of it's going to appear as 
subatomic particles that will decay before ever leaving the ocean. About a third of the, that energy is good for high energy neutrons, which we really can't do a whole lot with. The best way to deal with it is as waste heat. We absorb it and somehow dissipate the heat. That leaves us about a third for repulsion, and that's where I came up with this third number. Now, even if we take mechanical inefficiencies into place, uh, personally, I think about a one million ISP is still a pretty good factor. This is a good argument towards the line. What we'll use, I don't know. We don't have antimatter engines. Antimatter is very expensive to produce. It's probably more valuable than all the gold on the planet. Fusion, we don't have any ability to do fusion reactions very successfully right now. We haven't hit that, that break-even point where we get more energy back than we put into starter. Fission is probably more likely, but we have all the environmental concerns to deal with. And chemicals is what we're using today. It's not great, but it's what we have as a starting point. Once we have some idea, once we have settled on our propulsion system, our, all the problems of technical, we have the question of where do we go? We have a wish list. Think of a planet should be a lot like Earth. <coughs> this would save trouble. We could walk around to the surface. We could set up a colony there if that was our reason for going. The problem is we don't know of any. We can try to deduce what we think of this characteristic planet should be like. It should it should be in an area around the sun, around its star. Sometimes called the stellar biozone. I just recently saw a popular program for just the Goldilocks. So it's the area around a star that's not too hot, not too cold, <laughs> just right for life. A larger star, to be a hotter star, it tends to bump the biozone out a little further. It tends to widen it slightly. Smaller stars, colder, bring it in. The effect of this is larger stars are going to tend have a wider biozone, but maybe a better chance of a planet in there somewhere. The smaller ones may not. In terms of the solar systems around us, within about 10 light years of Earth, there's about 12 solar systems that we know of, 12 star systems. Only one of those has a star even remotely like our own, that's Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri happens to have a companion star. We don't know whether or not planets have formed. It's quite possible that companion stars have done much like Jupiter in our solar system and, and maybe present, prevented the formation of planets. There really aren't a lot of other stars that are very sun-like. We suspect, we only have one data point, we suspect a sun-like star is what's needed. The flip side, uh, recent years, Marcy and Butler have discovered through a, a interferometry technique, a indirect technique, by looking at the wall of the star, they have found planets. The problem these planets are, the technique isn't fine enough, it can only see planets the size of Jupiter larger. Uh, anything that's the size of Jupiter larger is a gas giant, it's probably not going to have life, can find life on Jupiter yet. But, the flip side is, if these Jupiters happen to be in the bottom zone, these warm Jupiters, they could have moons. Their moons could be earth like We don't know. We can't see anything that small. We hope we do. So as I said earlier, we, uh, our, where we're we going to go is depending on our propulsion system. We can't go very quickly, and we're not going to want to go 25 light years. If we can go very quickly, that's going to open our options. So that sort of leads us into our final question. Why are we going? This is probably the hardest. I don't really have an answer to this. I have some thoughts. We may go there for exploration. We seem to be a species that wants to explore. We may go there for colonization. This presents the benefits of getting us off the Earth. And something really bad, as we said earlier, if we're struck by an asteroid, if we have like, human life somewhere else. We also have the idea of a technology driver. This is my one chance to tie this into our own solar system. Whatever systems we would need 
to go out of our solar system easily be useful within our solar system. A life support system that will keep you going for 100 years will happily keep you going for five years to live on Mars. A propulsion system that will get you 50 light years so you have 10 years on board and get you to Pluto in a matter of days. Anything that we would do for interstellar should have good interplanetary tie backs. Again, why we're going is going to depend on where we're going. Where we're going is going to depend on how we're getting there. It's a very, in Greek mythology, Ouroboros, the snake that bites its own tail. There's this, this problem with your cell before you start. So, to leave our solar system to go somewhere else, we have these three questions we have to think about. They're very interrelated. We can't answer one without answering all of them. It's like in engineering design, we just train things where we cycle through. My personal thought is the place we're going to start this train case is the propulsion system. That's going to be the first place that we're going to work, and that's going to give us the first direction out of the world. So, any questions? On the propulsion systems, you had two of them, Newtonian and non-Newtonian. I think all your chemical, nuclear, fusion, antimatter, that was all Newtonian. That was Newtonian. Now, these non-Newtonians, that would be your beam power propulsion system. Uh, actually, no. In, in, even beam power is going to extend Newtonian. We're, we're sending the energy to there. By non-Newtonian, it was sort of something I didn't want to quite open up at this time. It's a whole subject on itself. Are things like field effect drives, uh, negative matter propulsion. These ideas, that you can you can find some as yet unknown law that relates to electromagnetism and gravity, and you have some sort of coil generator. I still be kind of the way that the aliens come to Earth and always in favor of the outer space movies. Maybe Einstein is a better way to describe it.
Dave Kaplan from the Johnson Space Center has come to talk to us about in situ propellant production on Mars, the first flight demonstration.
And so what I'm about to tell you is, is uh, based on hardware. We, uh, we looked at what it would take to conduct, to build and operate and function on the Mars surface and uh, an end-to-end -end propellant production plant. And as we laid out in our minds all of the components you would need in that plant on a, on a, on a table, and we looked at each component piece by piece and asked the question, what do you need to take to Mars to test because it's, it's involved so intimately with the Mars environment that you don't know enough to simulate the Mars environment accurately, the fidelity you would need to test that component, so you have to send it to Mars, versus which elements do you feel comfortable that you could, uh, you could indeed test on Earth and therefore uh, uh, use the chambers we have at the Johnson Space Center and other NASA facilities to, to save the cost of transportation. And when all was said and done, we came down with these major objectives for, uh, for why we want to send this payload to Mars. Just trying to see standing right in front of you. Am I interfering with your view? Okay, great. Now, no. Uh, <laughs> we, we want to go to Mars because we want to prove that we can preferentially collect the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and not the, the dust or the other trace components and reliably uh, compress that from the uh, from the six tor or 0.1 pounds per square inch that is Mars to about 14.7 square uh, pounds per square inch or about 800 tors, which is how we happen to want to operate the chemistry. And we want to produce oxygen. We just want to be able to demonstrate that we have effectively uh, produced oxygen. Uh, those of you who are not uh, propulsion engineers or rocket scientists, uh, when you launch rocket, you have to have an oxidizer and a fuel. Well, the oxidizer is, is oxygen, it's your best bet. And the fuel can be propane, methane, ethylene, hydrogen. Uh, there's, there's a large number. The fact is that typically it, it takes about four times the mass of oxygen to, to mix with the fuel. So the, the, the ratio is about four to one. It might be 3.5, and it depends on the exact chemistry. The point is about 80% of the mass of that rocket lifting off of the Mars surface is oxygen about 20% of the propellant will be the fuel. So just only in this very simple demonstration of oxygen, we, we will have made a huge step in reducing the amount of mass having to be taken to Mars. Uh, in addition to those other areas that we needed to go to Mars to test on, it has never been the case that we have put a solar array on the Mars surface that was, like, that was designed for Mars. The, the, uh, the Pathfinder mission, and the missions that are on their way to Mars right now use Galley, standard Galley Mars night arrays that are designed for low Earth orbit. They're not designed to operate at the bottom of a carbon di principally carbon dioxide, dirty, dusty, no oxygen, i.e. no ozone uh, atmosphere. So we're going to be taking, as I'll explain and show, uh, quite, a, quite a, a set of technologies to, to learn how to build optimum solar arrays for Mars. Uh, we're also, we've never put radiators on Mars before, so we're going to uh, look at design of something as pedestrian as radiators, but they're very important if you want to have a long life, simple uh, kind of production facility. We uh, are concerned about the dust on Mars, and we have several schemes we want to investigate on how you can prevent the dust from settling down over long missions and coating those solar arrays and reducing the power out. And we want to operate for long periods of time. We want to, uh, to demonstrate our ability to function in, a, in this environment uh, with a remote, robust system and, um, and begin, begin planning for large-term, long-term uh, presence on Mars. So in order to capture those five, uh, five objectives, uh, we actually now have five experiments. And uh, the first one is, is produced by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and have a few graphs on each of these to go into detail, but the point is that one is the, the it's a sorbent material, it's a kind of a molecular sieve, it will, it will capture the carbon dioxide. Uh, jumping down on the chart to the bottom, we have an oxygen generation system, which I'll describe, which is how we're going to actually crack that carbon dioxide and, and get the oxygen out. We have two experiments provided by the recently renamed John Glenn Research Center at Lewis Field, and here I have a distinct advantage time-wise. Uh, later in this session, Jeff Landis is going to talk about these two missions. Uh, I am the principal investigator for this payload MIP. Jeff is, is a co-investigator. He is the lead for the, uh, for the dust uh, accumulation and, and removal test. He will also be speaking about his uh, colleague's payload, which is the solar array test. So I'm going to gloss over that rather quickly, knowing that Jeff is going to spend his full time with you explaining that in detail. 
finally, we have the fifth experiment, which is uh, a radiator demonstration. Also, that is provided by the, the Jeff Propulsion Laboratory. So in the remaining time, let me quickly go through some of these experiments and tell you why we think they're really uh, innovative and unique. Uh, this is the, uh, the sorbent bed, the device which is going to uh, capture the carbon dioxide. It's sized about the size of a 12-inch uh, soda pop can. It is filled with a pelletized material called zeolite, a particular version of the like 13 x for those who really care. And what happens is that at the very cold night temperatures at Mars, and Mars will get down to about minus 140 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 88 degrees centigrade, at those cold night temperatures, this material uh, preferentially allows a carbon dioxide molecule to, to fall into the interstitial space and captures it. The argon and the nitrogen molecules are too large, they're not captured, so they kind of, they're not retained. When daytime comes, we close the valve, which has exposed the atmosphere to this bed, and we allow both the natural daytime heating as well as supplemental electric heating to, to take place, and we heat the bed up. And shortly after the bed gets above about zero degrees centigrade, it starts giving off that carbon dioxide. And as we continue to heat the bed, more and more of that comes off, and we then open the valve and feed that carbon dioxide screen into the oxygen generation system. Except for one valve, it's all solid state. There's no moving parts. Uh, the, the reliability of that is, is, is quite high. Well, where does it feed the uh, feed its carbon dioxide into a, a uh, an oxygen generation system, which is a unique new technology we'll be testing for the first time uh, as we go to Mars. Uh, this dome is about oh, eight inches tall, and uh, and it is shaped like that because it has to contain a uh, a hockey puck sized okay, maybe a large Oreo cookie-sized uh, ceramic disc made of a substance called zirconia. And the reason it's encased in the stone is because the zirconia cell is going to get up to a very high temperature, 700 degrees centigrade. And we don't want its heat to, to fry all of the, uh, the components around it. So we fill that dome with a, a, a powdered insulation, and that's just to contain the heat. But within the dome, you'll see a picture that we feed in the carbon dioxide feedstock to the top side of this dome. And here's a quick course in chemistry, so you have to learn something from this talk now. And the, uh, the science is that if you feed carbon dioxide into a zirconia disc, which has platinum electrodes on both sides, so, so the zirconia is the cream of your Oreo cookie, and the platinum electrodes are the, are, are the dark cookie part of the cookie. What happens is carbon dioxide goes right through platinum as if it wasn't there. And where a carbon dioxide molecule encounters zirconia platinum at a temperature of 700 degrees centigrade, it gives off an oxygen ion. That's the property of zirconia. So now you have an oxygen ion, and, and with these two platinum electrodes, you put a very small voltage, one volt, two volt, not 120 volts, just one or two volts, and that's enough to cause that oxygen ion to fly right through the interface. It goes right through the zirconia. Um, when it comes out the back end, it, it, gets an, it gets an electron, it finds another oxygen atom, and it forms an oxygen molecule in the weak blink of an eye. However, the property of zirconia is that it will not allow carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide to penetrate it. It's totally impermeable to those two elements. So there's a, a the, the, the carbon dioxide from the reaction and any unreacted carbon dioxide just simply uh, are prevented from penetrating. So on the one side, you're getting pure oxygen. On the other side, you're getting uh, the unreacted elements. So we have two tubes coming in. Here's your tube with the pure carbon dioxide. And here's the tube which is taking uh, the unreacted material away. And guaranteed on the bottom side is pure oxygen. And in fact, the amount of oxygen is uniquely defined by the current going through this loop, so you know exactly and precisely how much you're making. Well, that was my, my uh, course in, in chemistry and physics. The bottom line is there's no moving parts. Other than a valve you may have to open to, to allow the carbon dioxide to flow, what you have is a system where you simply heat it up, and it will produce oxygen, and, uh, and you can determine the flow rates and everything you need. So it's another technology we're looking at uh, Whose, whose function on Mars we believe will be robust enough to, uh, to operate in that environment. This is a 
an actual picture of the development unit, the engineering development unit, which uh, was completed in February and underwent six weeks of testing at Mars. And the real reason I'm showing this picture to you is to have you concentrate on this top plane. And when uh, Jeff Landis uh, begins his talk, he's going to talk about that top plane in much greater detail because it is that top plane which contains the, uh, the solar array experiments here and the dust removal experiments there. And um, Jeff is envious. I think I've got this chart. He may not. He may steal it from me. Uh, but let me just give you a quick uh, quick overview. So you, you, you asked, why are we sending this payload to Mars? What are we going to learn? The answer is that we're going to learn what we need in order to build new solar arrays. So uh, to begin with, there's, there's, there's engineering versus science dichotomy here. The engineer says, well, let me think about what arrays should work best on Mars. I'm going to take a guess what they are. And so the engineer has, here's one pair of cells, second pair of cells, third pair, fourth and a fifth. So we have five cells that the, uh, the researchers say ought to by gosh work at Mars in that environment for that length of time. Five different cells. There's a pair in case one fails. You'll, you'll have those results. Um, they also say, well, here's an array of cells to see how they work as an array. And here's a second array. Again, two different kinds of cells. And that's the, let's go to Mars and, and see what we get. But in addition, there's a, there's a spectrometer. There's radiometers and there's a spectrometer here so that we will actually measure the precise amount of light that makes it all the way to the Mars surface. And uh, again, I won't steal Jeff's thunder too much, except to say that if you have this information and you were a solar cell designer, you could design what would work best on the, in the Mars environment. Okay, also, if you uh, look at this half of the, the plate, you're going to see a series of, of, uh, of devices and, and um, sensors whose purpose is to understand dust. Um, we have a microscope. We're going to watch individual grains of dust fall from the Mars atmosphere and understand their, their shape, their properties, uh, and, and things we can see as we see them. We're also going to be checking their, uh, their electric properties. Uh, in essence, this is a high voltage solar array. And here's three cells. One will be charged plus 100 to zero to ground. The other minus 100 to ground. The third one plus 100 to minus 100. As the dust particles settle down, if they preferentially go towards one cell and not the other, it tells us that there's, a, there's an inherent charge. Okay, great. And uh, we're also going to be taking uh, 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 cells that are very simply just tilted to see if the dust will fall off of, uh, off of a tilted array. The, uh, the final, the fifth and final experiment is, is uh, rather mundane. It's, we're going to take some, uh, some radiators to Mars. There will be uh, four radiators, different emissivities, different absorptivities, just, you know, strange words to say, different performances. And two of them will be covered. We have a little cover. And those we maintain in the pristine condition. And once every week or so on Mars, we'll open the cover and we'll allow them to radiate up at night. And so the idea is that at night, about midnight, we, uh, we have a little heating element at the base of the uh, radiator. Uh, radiator. It heats it to a known temperature. And then you watch how it radiates away uh, to, uh, to the night sky, and that tells you uh, an indication of which of these radiators is performing. Um, two ways, they say, will be degraded as time goes on by their exposure to the Mars environment, uh, and two others will be kept pristine. This is a picture of the 2001 lander, and um, this is the MIP box, and uh, just for interest, uh, this box is a radiation dosimetry experiment specifically designed to understand how biological material like humans uh, react to the Mars, uh, Mars radiation environment. And this is an experiment uh, that will examine the toxicity of the soil and dust on Mars. In essence, the arm will scoop up uh, samples of the soil and pour it into four uh, different wet chemistry cells there. There's a panoramic camera and a thermal vision electrometer we're looking at. And there's a rover that is identical to the Sojourner Truth rover. Uh, the Pathfinder mission is called Marie Curie. So basically, uh, what I wanted to say is that um, we have hardware. Oh. We're running a backwards program. Um, we have actual hardware uh, whose function is to take the first steps uh, of allowing a new technology uh, to be implemented into our strategies for, for uh, examining and exploring Mars. 
we're going to uh, actually produce oxygen in uh, 2001 on Mars from Martian materials. This is the first step of an ongoing series of demonstrations for those uh, subsequent robotic missions. So we'll get more and more ambitious, including producing fuel and launching things and, and uh, paving the way for both sample return missions as well as human missions to Mars.
discuss a little bit of the engine research that's been done to date, and then address some of the mission profiles that an O2CO engine could address, talk about some of the issues with engine development for this particular propellant combination, and then I'm going to come up with a flight test proposal, a way that we could uh, test this type of engine and kind of get caught up with some of the uh, other engine propellant combinations that are more extensively uh, hardware tested. Particularly with the uh, planning of Pathfinder on Mars, has been a, a big interest in Mars missions. And uh, this has caused us people to start looking at uh, past propellant combinations that they wouldn't necessarily have considered. Over the last 10 years, O2 and CO has just kind of bubbled up to the surface. Originally, when people went off in, uh, from the 50s onward did propellant research, they uh, examined anything under the sun. Anything that was lower performance, they tossed out. And anything that was higher performance, like oxygen chlorine, they said, oh, that'd be great. Uh, the key here is that as we come around and people start talking about in situ resource uh, utilization, they found that things that didn't perform as well when they're right there in front of you were the better choices. Over the last 10 years, particularly at Lewis, great strides have been made in engine development for O2CO combination. However, it still has a way to go to meet some of the ones that are commonly used for launching uh, these no launch vehicles uh, today. Just a quick summary. Uh, one of the earliest uh, papers that I found had to do with uh, James Prange when he talked about the first three. He looked at oxygen and carbon monoxide, oxygen and hydrogen, and oxygen and methane. And a lot of super important you see methane is, is, is one of the primary choices. Um, the nice thing about oxygen and carbon monoxide is it's available anywhere. You land on Mars, it's a uh, atmosphere is 95% uh, CO2, so you've got a resource right at your fingertips that you can just draw in. Uh, one of the cons against it is low performance, and then you also we don't have an extensive engine development program out there for that combination. For oxygen and hydrogen, it's one of your highest performances. Engine development is very mature. Uh, the problem is, given the, the low level of water vapor, unless you say I'm going to restrict myself to the poles or I'm going to locate permafrost first, you're restricting yourself to where you can, you, you can locate. For oxygen and methane, uh, it's a better performance than uh, O2CO. Uh, some engine development has been done. Uh, a number of uh, Russian engines have been proposed to use the oxygen methane combination. The, uh, and in fact, uh, the X33 added to control system jets are going to use gaseous oxygen and gaseous methane. The disadvantage is that you, still, you must bring uh, H2 or find it as uh, in terms of water and then electrolyze it. So the generation is a little more complex than that. O2 CO. Uh, another propellant combination that was proposed to JSC was uh, oxygen acetylene. It has a high performance, which is good. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, it's more complex to generate. The advantage here over methane is that because you've got C2H2 instead of CH4, you only have to carry half as much hydrogen. It was also found that you could burn oxygen acetylene uh, carbon monoxide mixture which reduces the amount of uh, hydrogen that you have with a hit performance. And, and on top of that, you can potentially use trace water vapor to generate your, your hydrogen. So you almost get it totally away from your earth-based resource. Uh, the final two are less developed. Uh, it's been proposed to use uh, magnesium from the, uh, the Martian soil. Uh, the proposal there was to combine it into like a, a gel with oxygen and combine it all into one monopropellant tank. It's nice having a monopropellant, you have multiple valves, you have multiple your system. However, when you start processing soil, then you begin your more complex than just using uh, the atmosphere. The uh, last one, uh, CO2, using it as a, a working fluid, uh, in the same way that you use hydrogen in a nerve-type engine. You have a low performance there. Shielding would be extensive. We don't have a lot of experience with that type of system. And politically, I don't think any time soon we're going to be seeing a nuclear uh, engine testing. Um, moving on to generation methods. Um, one of the ones I think you all just presented was uh, solid uh, oxidizer electrolyte, where such as the zirconia is the membrane element, the electrolyzer. There's been a high level of hardware developments that are getting ready to be a flight test on the 2001 lander. Um, some of the disadvantages of the temps are kind of higher than uh, some of the other systems, at least initially when it was proposed, and it's considered mechanically fragile. Another one that's been proposed in the University of Arizona that started work on is uh, molten carbonate electrolyzers. They've been 
used to kill cells at lower temperatures. However, the testing is just, uh, just starting with those. Um, another one is GLOW, where uh, you use it, uh, silver as your uh, an element. Um, it takes lower temps. It's, it's self-filtering, so some of the concerns that you would have to have screens and have to clean those screens for some of the other systems uh, is an advantage. It also has a limited testing proposals to increase it and then to uh, put an RF signal through instead of just a, a DC uh, current. Uh, the last one is reverse uh, water gas shift. Here you uh, take uh, carbon, carbon dioxide and hydrogen and put it through a catalytic converter. Your output is carbon monoxide and water, and then you could electrolyze your water and kick it back into your system to recycle it again. Uh, it's complex, it takes two units, um, however, it has a pretty high level of development on the order of the uh, solid oxide and electrolytes. Those are sort of the what I'll call the four big methods. In terms of engine research, beginning about 1991-1990, Lewis started a program where um, they started with a subscale rocket. It used a gaseous oxidizer and oxidizer oxygen and carbon monoxide, and it was operated over a range of oxidizer fuel ratios we wanted to see the performance. Uh, the initial pressures were 77 to 155 psi. It was all copper, and the length of runtime was on the order of 1.2 seconds. The advance that they next made was a uh, water-cooled combustion chamber with a heat sink nozzle. They did this for two reasons. One, to further their examination of the uh, combustion conditions in the chamber, um, and they increased the pressure to 155 to 300 ran for a lot, as long as six seconds, and also studied the thermal uh, transport characteristics for, for the combination. The most recent one that they developed, and I'm not aware if it's been test fired yet, was in 96, when uh, they designed a five, uh, 500 PSI uh, chamber engine. Uh, it was 500 pounds thrust, and it used uh, refractory metals for the uh, cooling. The size was based off the study of where they wanted to come up with a typical engine for a sample return of the commission. It produced uh, a spin of 277 seconds and had an area ratio of 200. It had a unique, at least in the design, uh, combed, uh, combed nozzle, which then went into a bell instead of starting straight, straight from a bell. Uh, for the actual test engine, they cut that off because it was operating at uh, sea level conditions. Those are sort of the three big hardware programs out there. In terms, just to get an idea of, of how big of an engine you need to develop. Obviously, you don't need to develop a space shuttle with a size engine. Um, some of the different proposals that have been proposed, one is the ballistic hopper. And one of the, the very simple uh, lander type, uh, I'll call it the simplest hopper in the world, would be to take like uh, the oxygen generator system hardware in an oxidizer fuel ratio that you generated of, of 0.5 to 1, Leave it as a gas mixture, fill basically the equivalent of a, a liter or two liter tank, uh, and then just fire it from the surface to, as a demonstration of, of that you can generate the useful propellant. Um, a more useful design is the small hopper, and the uh, University of Arizona has proposed something called Warpex. And Warpex is basically uh, something like Pathfinder with a rocket engine on the base with uh, to control jets. And the idea is that it would uh, go to a site for 10, 14 days generate its uh, own propellants, and then um, go, say, one kilometer away, and now examine a new site. And that kind of deals a good, good, good maneuver. A much larger hopper was proposed by JPL back in like, 1986 uh, that could go on the order of 100, 1,000 kilometers. And that's, we take an engine of about 8,300 pounds thrust. As you then look at uh, what I call small orbital rendezvous, large orbital rendezvous, you get two ways to come home. One is you rendezvous with the vehicle that's, that brought you there, which is using Earth-based propellants, and that's the orbital rendezvous case. The other is you generate everything you need on the surface, and then you put yourself in a little pool uh, back, back, back home. Um, on those cases, for the small orbital rendezvous, you're looking at engines of about 515 pounds, uh, large is closer to 50,000, and then it increases as you go. That's just to give you an idea of the type of engines that need to be developed, the type of uh, hardware programs that need to occur. Two key issues uh, for these type of engines. The first is ignition. It's been found that it's not always uh, easy to, to ignite. 
oxygen and carbon monoxide. The way that you get around that is you introduce a little hydrogen. You get a little hydrogen and oxygen burning first, and that ignites the, uh, the other propellants. Uh, this adds complexity. It would be nice not to have to depend upon a earth based resource, uh, particularly if that system failed. And, and when you do laser emission studies have occurred, they, were, they still had to introduce an additional uh, item into the, into the chamber. They found that they could introduce water. It didn't have to be hydrogen. With the laser emission, you could uh, get emission just by injecting water, which then leads to the question if there was something that you could introduce that you have at your, your site, such as, say, margin dust, that would, again, cause the reaction to occur. Um, you could also use trace, uh, traces of water vapor play. Uh, cooling is another item that still needs a lot of uh, in intensive research. So far, uh, just as in the 500 pound motor that uh, Lewis has designed, they went with cracker metals. As we go to larger and larger engines for uh, manned return vehicles, you're going to need to go to pump bed systems, which is going to give you a higher heat flux. As you do that, you've got to come up with a way to get rid of the heat. Uh, ways that we discussed include uh, ceramic deposits as in the Lewis engine. Uh, film cooling, which uh, the V2s in World War II used, you sacrifice the propellant for uh, performance. You could also burn off ratio, which is proposed in the JPL ballistic hopper. Um, technically, the ideal solution is a genetic cooling. And both oxygen and carbon monoxide have been looked at and are possible uh, genetic coolants with uh, carbon monoxide being the clear paper. Okay, now we get to my favorite. Um, based on everything that uh, I've shown you so far, it would be nice if we could have a flight demonstration. And I want to call it the Mars Technology Demonstration Spacecraft. The idea would be that uh, you have this four major experiments. The first would be propulsion. And based on the, uh, looking at the hopper, uh, looking at the sample return missions I proposed with a 2,000 pound thrust uh, engine, this could equally be replaced by four uh, Lewis 500 pound engines, pound thrust engines. Um, a uh, complement of O2 CO production uh, facilities like the uh, oxygen generating system. Uh, one is uh, soxy, one is uh, molten carbonate, one is low, one is uh, work order uh, gas aggregation. In addition, you could have uh, solar panel tests where the, now you're not going to be at the right distance to the sun. You could still use prototypes and then take into account where, where you were and what you'd expect. And then the final would be a one third G tether. A mission profile that you can follow would be to uh, take uh, your spacecraft, make it shuttle deployable. Um, you deploy it from the shuttle, and I'm going to later here talk about uh, a couple of different spacecrafts that fill that bill. But um, from the, to do an RMS deploy, you back away from it. The uh, engine that you mounted on your, your spacecraft fires, leading on board O2 and the CO tanks that you brought along. At that point, once you've done your burn, which is probably an out, out of plane burn, so that you'd stay within the orbital altitude, whatever it is around you, you would then deploy a tether. And once the tether had been deployed and uh, rose 200 meters, uh, and you would start a rotation of about 1.85 revolutions per minute, that would give you a simulated Mars one third uh, gravity. At that point, you would start your O2CO generation experiments so that you could actually have them perform one third G they would then use another CO2 tank that uh, we had brought along to refill the O2 and CO tanks that you've already burned. At the completion of your generation, you would halt rotation, reel in your tether, and fire your engine using the propellants that you have produced. Uh, the shuttle would then retrieve your spacecraft, and you can perform post flight inspections, and potentially, if uh, not much money for this, but you potentially have a series of MTDS. Uh, spacecraft performance for you test different engines, you test different uh, generation systems. Um, the tether is one of those things that needs to be tested. Everybody proposes it for more emissions that uh, has not been shown in a spacecraft operation environment. Uh, for spacecraft options, uh, two obvious ones and then another way to go. One would be SPAS. Uh, the SPAS is a trust spacecraft that flew uh, one four times actually five or six, if you count its other incarnations. But uh, Orpheus files and Christus files are two stress segments wide. Uh, they generally use telescopes. You can have experimental plat uh, uh, mounting platforms that allow you to modularize the spacecraft. The key is that uh, you can make the system affordable by using an arc link 
spacecraft already comes with an arc link, it already comes with command data management system, CMS, it already comes with zone attitude control system. These are things that you don't have to develop. Uh, Wake Shield, which is built at the University of Houston, which this experiment is not compatible with standard mission, but uh, if it didn't fly as long as gravity, uh, weight experiment, it also would be potentially a spacecraft bus that would be used to fly an experiment like this. Um, the last case would be you don't go the shuttle route because it does get very expensive, and that is where you go an expendable launch vehicle micro payload, such as the Ariane 4 or Ariane 5, it's also being proposed for the Delta 4 and Delta 5, um, where they've got space for small payloads that are being used now for around some hard missions. Uh, smaller reduces the mission that you can be able to accomplish, but you also might be able to make it uh, shuttle recovery. So you might be able to deploy from the uh, ELB, go to an altitude, using your propellant, and then be picked up by the shuttle. So, uh, finally, inclusion. Uh, the propellant combination of uh, oxygen and carbon monoxide remains one of the primary Mars and situ resources. Engine development has been extensive over the last uh, 10 years. However, in order to match the uh, ELB propellant choices for launch vehicles that we see today, like uh, liquid hydrogen, uh, liquid oxygen, uh, nitrogen tetroxide, monomethyl hydrogen, then a lot of work still needs to be done. Hopefully, the funding will be out there to do that. One of the ways to demonstrate uh, Mars uh, technology hardware prior to actually meeting Mars was come up with a portable flight test program where engine designs could be uh, tested. And I think that's one of the ways that would be a key for getting uh, mission designers to accept the O2 uh, CO combination of the propellant of choice. Questions? Did you hear about the